and I will talk about uh, a spiking model that try to account for some of the features that uh, is uh, uh, that are observable uh, in the cortex. Uh, actually, the um, recent measurement allowed to to measure with a high spatial and temporal resolution the activity of many neurons at the same time. So the collective activity of many uh, neurons in the same moment. And these are hard to compare with, mo with the models. OK, it's OK. Um, hard to do a comparison with model about how this collective activity emerged from the interaction among units. Uh, the feature that we want to account, one of the two features that we want to account is the critical behavior that has been observed in the brain, in particular since 2003, uh, from the work of uh, Dietmann Plans, um, people have started to uh, look at the spontaneous activity as a bunch of avalanche uh, whose size is distributed according to a power law. So uh, uh, do, you, do you look at my mouse? In the, no, OK. If you look at the, the activity, uh, so uh, you can measure this uh, temporal clustering whose size is the number of units that are active in each avalanche. And we can measure the size, how distributed this uh, size of avalanche in people for this power law that uh, uh, cut off scale with the size of the system. And this has been observed uh, later also in vivo. So, and this power law is very nice reproduced in many experiments and a lot of other signature criticality, not only this scale invariant, but other signature criticality like long, temp long range temporal correlation and so on, make people think about that spontaneous activity at rest may be something that had to do with the, a system at a critical point where also susceptibility is maximum. And the other feature that we want to account uh, is the regards the, the function of the brain as a memory for face coded information, so face coded pattern. So people uh, looking at, at the play cell and grid cell uh, see that uh, the information of the is uh, coded in the precise spatial temporal relationship among spikes. So not only rate. Uh, code for the position of the animal in the maze, but also the precise phase relationship among the units and between spike and the, the oscillating rhythm, so the, the, the um, lo local field potential that is uh, oscillating. So this phase code for information and uh, mm, it's been uh, also observed that, that the precise Face locked oscillation, so the process of face locked pattern is uh, replayed when the animal at, is at rest, but also during sleep. So you you look at the upper part of the <laughs> of the of the slide. Um, the activity during the run, sort of during the task of the cortex, and on on the left, uh, on the right, sorry, uh, uh, hippocampus activity. And you see that the same uh, precise temporal ordering of the spike is reproduced during sleep. So, uh, without pointer, is <laughs> I, I, I'm. So you 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 found that in the sleep after task, you see the same temporal pattern, and so people think that uh, not only the rate so who, which neuron is spiking, but also when is spiking is important for coding information and also for, um, for coding so, um, information in the memory as a memory pattern. So during the, so the, the idea, the, 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 the framework that emerged is that uh, the precise temporal relationship of this pattern is stored in the connectivity of the network. So what is important are the connection, so the synapses among units, and once this pattern has been stored, can be replayed also with the just a noisy input as it may happen during sleep. And so see, this reactivation is functional for memory consolidation. 
So we, uh, our question is, how is it related, this uh, storing of information, storing of these uh, memory trays that are uh, coded to, to phase of activity, and with the scale invariant uh, activity, uh, so the criticality that has been observed at rest. So how these two related among them, and we build a model that is thinking to function as a memory for this dynamical pattern. So we store in the connectivity minor tractor, dynamical tractor for the many possible, uh, for the many uh, spatial temporal pattern that we want to store in the network. And then we just look at the phase diagram of this network and we see that, recognize that there is a, a region in the parameter space where also criticality occurs. So scale invariant avalanche has been observed also in the model. So the same model that account for both the phenomenology. Um, so we start with trying to store this pattern in the network. And uh, of course what is important is the the learning rule that we use, so the, the connectivity as I told you, since the simple unit are simple integrated and, spire, is integrated and firing units, so very simple unit, but the collective, emer the collective uh, dynamics emerge from the connectivity that we uh, use. And so to, to, ch to set the connectivity, we use the spike time dependent plasticity that's been uh, observed from 1997 by Markram. And, and since then, a lot of people measure this, this uh, very interesting plasticity rule that set the strength of the connection, uh, increases the strength of the connection when the presynaptic neurons fire few milliseconds after the postsynaptic neuron. So, for example, about 10 milliseconds, we have uh, strong, the, the strongest uh, potentiation of the synapses. But if the spikes occur on the other way around, so the presynaptic occurs after the postsynaptic neuron spike, then we have depression of the synapses. So, this plasticity rule is very sensitive to few millisecond time difference among units of the presynaptic and postsynaptic pyramidal neuron. So we use this, uh, the, the red dots are the, the experimental data, the, the line, the black line is uh, the fit, so the, the, the line that we use in our mathematical uh, uh, learning view. And so we choose some pattern to, um, in which we have both uh, a variable zero one that say who have to be silent which neuron had to be silent in that pattern, and uh, who had to fire, but also a phase that says how long, uh, wh when these neurons have to fire with respect to the, all the others, okay? So we store this activity using this plasticity rule, uh, where A here in the learning rule, the A is uh, exactly the, the function that we take from the spike time the plasticity, uh, spike time dependent plasticity in the cortex, observed in the cortex. And then we sum, just sum one of each uh, other, all the connectivity that comes from the many pattern that we want to store as usual, as also Opfield did. Uh, and we check that this network is able to reproduce so reactivate, so replay the spatial temporal pattern that we have stored in the network, both when the Q is present, so just a short input similar to one of the many patterns, then this pattern, so selectively we reactivate this dynamical pattern, and then we also study the, the spontaneous activity of this network where just persona noise is, is given as an input, okay? And Regarding the two-induced uh, replay, uh, we, we can measure, of course, so the network works as a, a memory uh, device, so we can selectively reactivate the pattern. For example, here, 
in, the, in red, there is a replay of one pattern in which half of the neurons should be silent and the other should fire in a sequential order. And when we give just one, or just one tenth of the neuron firing like the pattern, then all the pattern goes on self, in a self-sustained manner. So just a small short cue make the pattern reproduce in a self-sustaining man manner. So this is a selective reactivation of the pattern, and we can, of course, compute, okay, the storage capacity of the network, so how many, how many patterns we can do such that we still have this, uh, f this feature of storage, of storage capacity, so, so this feature of retrieval, and, but what I want to, sto to study uh, to show you is the behavior of this network when only a noisy input is presented, so the spontaneous activity of this network, and we, we can distinguish uh, the regime in which the self-sustained, that we were the self-sustained replay of the pattern, from the regime in which we have only random, no, random Poissonian activity, and in between there is the critical region in which we observe scaling variant avalanche, and in which uh, these, these patterns are stored, but uh, they are not really well stored in the network. So just uh, we have a short reactivation, then nothing, then another short reactivation, and so on. And uh, here in this critical regime, we have the, the model distribution of the firing rate that is, of course, observed also experimentally. So we can study the phase diagram of this network. On the, on the right, we have the critical regime. On the left, uh, we have the the behavior as a memory, so hysteresis and the self-sustained the replay and so on. And uh, if you look at this uh, critical line between the self-sustained and the spontaneous uh, Poissonian low activity, then we measure the, we look at the uh, power law distribution of the avalanche, we just cut off the depend from the size of the network, we check the data collapses uh, works fine, also the uh, scaling relationship among these critical exponents are satisfied. Uh, then we can move a little bit uh, 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 up and down and we see supercritical and uh, subcritical behavior, uh, similar to when drugs are applied to the network, and I don't talk to you about how these avalanche we recently measure also in um, doing sleep, so in human with the EEG, um, just a conclusion, we, in this model we start by studying a lot of years ago how these uh, self-sustained, uh, how it happens, this uh, selective replay of uh, uh, spatial temporal pattern, and the same network we then found also the regime in which there is this uh, scale-free behavior and uh, uh, criticality. So thank you to uh, for your attention, and I want to thank uh, um, people that, uh, from many point of view, have uh, uh, contributed to this uh, research. So, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present in my data. Today, I will show you how nucleoporin 153 deficiency in adult neural stem cell defines a pathological protein network signature and defective neurogenesis in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by progressive memory loss and cognitive dysfunction. It can have a familiar or, in most cases, a sporadic origin. The main pathological features of AD are the accumulation of beta amyloid peptide intraneurally and in extracellular plaque and the formation of the tau aggregates. The brain of Alzheimer's disease patients undergoes a synapse loss, mostly in ventricles and hippocampus, which are the main niches of adult neurogenesis. Uh, the niches contain uh, neural progenitors that are able to differentiate into new neuronal cells, providing a cellular reservoir for replacement of cells lost during normal cell turnover and after brain injury. However, neurogenesis does not compensate for neuronal loss in age-related ne neurodegenerative disorders, and the impaired neurogenesis contributes to cognitive dysfunction and memory loss in Alzheimer's disease. Since the mechanism implicated in defective neurogenesis are still unclear, we are trying to find new potential modulators of neurogenesis to boost endogenous brain repair. 
In the last years, uh, in our laboratory, we focused on nucleoporins, which are proteins that form large channels embedded in the nuclear envelope, uh, known as nuclear pore complex. The main uh, function of nucleoporins is the nuclear cytoplasmic uh, import-export. Besides uh, this function, uh, nucleoporins of the nucleoplasmic ring are able to take contact with chromatin, and so they have a role in gene regulation, chromatin structure, and genome stability. In our laboratory, it has been shown that uh, nucleoporin 153 can act as gene regulator in several contexts, uh, such as the heart of dystrophic mice or in cancer. Moreover, a paper from Gage and uh, his group shows that SNAP 153 can act uh, as, uh, uh, as a role also in the maintenance of neural progenitor cells through the interaction with the transcription factor SOX2. In my talk, uh, I will show you which is the contribution of NAP-153 to defective neurogenesis in AD, how we can target NAP to improve neurogenesis in AD, and which are the pathways regulated by NAP. Our model are triple transgenic mice that uh, carry mutation in three genes involved in AD pathogenesis, the amyloid beta precursor protein, PSN1, and PSN2. They reproduce both A beta and tau pathology. First of all, we, we performed an immunofluorescence on aquacampa slice from wild type and AD mice, and we observed that uh, NAP-153 levels were reduced in uh, a neural stem cell from AD mice in comparison to wild type ones. And the phenotype was conserved in neural stem cells cultured as neurospheres. To assess if the NAP overexpression in AD neural stem cell could rescue the proliferation, we analyzed the BRDU incorporation in wild type and uh, AD neural stem cells transduced with a lentiviral vector carrying NAP-153. And we found that uh, the BRDU incorporation was higher for cells with uh, NAP overexpression. The same experiment was performed in neurospheres, and not only the proliferation of AD NAP neurospheres was higher, but the, these cells were also bigger. Then we analyzed the migration of neural stem cells, since this is important for differentiation. And so we performed a scratch on the plate, and we measured the time for the cells to close the gap. Um, the uh, AD neural stem cells were slower than wild type, while the migration of AD NAP neural stem cells was similar to wild type ones. Uh, moreover, the immunofluorescence for the modificated form of neural, stem, of neural cell adhesion molecule displayed very high levels of this protein in wild type neural stem cells, a lower expression in AD neural stem cells, while the expression of NAP-153 recovered the levels of PSA and CAM in AD NAP cells. We, um, we uh, found also that NAP-153 overexpression recovered the expression of genes involved in differentiation, such as REST, MESH1, and NARD1. And the restoration of differentiation was confirmed by an immunofluorescence for beta-free tubulin and MAP2. Levels of both markers were higher in AD NAP cells in comparison to wild type ones, uh, and, uh, which means a higher degree of maturation. And uh, these cells displayed also an higher than dry length. Uh, then the registration of sodium, uh, the recording of sodium current showed again that AD NAP cells were more mature than AD ones. This data prompts us to analyze the effect of NAP 153 overexpression in vivo. Mice were injected with a lentiviral vector carrying NAP 153 and then with BRDU for five days and analyzed at different times with histological techniques and behavioral tests. We checked the expression of the lentivirus and the proliferation through an immunofluorescence and we found the double positive cells for GFP and BRDU. And the early differentiation stage was analyzed uh, through an immunofluorescence for BRDU and double curtain. And we found that levels of both markers were decreased in AD mice, while the uh, expression of the lentivirus carrying NAP-153 um, led to a higher number of double positive cells. 
the lentiviral mediated enough of expression increased also the PSA and can expression in AD mice. Then uh, we performed another immunofluorescence to analyze the, the integration of BRDU and mu N positive cells in the granule layer after one month from the lentiviral mediated NAP overexpression. Mu N is a marker of, of mature cells, so we can see that the NAP overexpression is able to induce a higher number of mature cells that migrate in the granule layer. Moreover, the uh, behavioral test Morris Water Maze showed that only a DNAP mice were able to remember the position of the hidden platform. So, NAP 153 overexpression is able to improve mice cognitive performance. Then we studied the NAP 153 associated proteins through proteomic analysis, and we found several, pro several common proteins associated with wild type and the AD neural stem cells, but also specific proteins associated in wild type or in AD neural stem cells. Performing the gene ontology analysis on wild type neural stem cells, we uh, found that uh, NAP 153 is associated with proteins involved in RNA biogenesis, processing and transport, nuclear import export, gene regulation, chromatin remodeling, and mitochondrial regulation. The same analysis performed on AD neural stem cells displayed that NAP is associated with uh, proteins belonging to molecular processes such as energy metabolism, oxidative stress, RNA catabolic processes, proteasomal pathway, and gene regulation. To further analyze this data, we applied the CAG database analysis to find the main pathways in which genes associated with NAP are involved and we found uh, pathways of neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's disease, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, proteasomal and catabolic processing. In conclusion, NAP uh, protein levels are reduced in AD neural stem cells in vitro and in vivo. NAP restoration recovers the appropriate response of AD neural stem cells to both proliferation and differentiation stimuli in vitro and in vivo. NAP delivery in vivo counteracts a cognitive deficit in AD mice, and proteomic-based approach reveals the implication of NAP protein networks in the protection from neurodegenerative, oxidative, and degradative pathways in AD neural stem cells. Altogether, these data suggest that NAP might be a therapeutic target to boost neurogenesis in AD. At the end, I want to thank uh, to my supervisor, Claudio Colossi, Federica Conte for computational analysis of proteomic data and the group of Prof. Grassi from Catholic University and the Alzheimer Association. Hello everyone, my name is Marcello Pompa. I am a PhD student from Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore and also collaborate with the BioMATLAB group from CNR IASI. And the present work deals with the development of a new mathematical model able to describe the interactions between thyroid hormones and other elements. The thyroid is one of the largest endocrine gland in the human being. It secretes two major hormones, T4 thyroxine and T3 thyroidotyronine. This secretion is controlled by the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, that is produced by the anterior pituitary gland through a negative control feedback. The DSH controls the T4 and T3 production and secretion, and high circulating level of these two hormones inhibit in turn the TRH and TSH production. TRH stands for thyrotropin releasing hormone and is produced by the hypothalamus. This negative control feedback is also called hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis, HPT. Furthermore, the T4 and T3 production depends on the iodine intake during the day. It is estimated that necessary quantity of iodine is about 1 mg a week, assumed by means of food and water. The objectives of this work are to describe the physiology of the human thyroid by means of system of odors, to simulate the metabolism of TSH, T4 and T3 during the day, and to validate the mathematical model with experimental data under different scenarios. In this slide, we can see the block diagram of the model composed by five submodels. We have the thyroglobulin, iodine, hormone, 
TRH and TSH submodels. These last two are important next slide. In the center, we have the iodine submodel, starting with the iodine in a meal, passing through the gastrointestinal model, and appearing the blood with the rate of appearance of the iodine function, the iodine function. Once in the blood, the iodine is absorbed by the thyroid by means of the NIST function, sodium iodide symporter. The iodine in the thyroid is transformed in T3 and T4 by means of the TPON function, thyroperoxidase. Part of the T3 and T4 produced in this way are stored in the depot compartment, and another part is released in the blood compartment, passing through the extracellular block first. The T4 in the blood compartment is converted in two ways in T3, one fast, diodinase T4 in T3, and one slow, diodinase delay compartment. The T3 and T4 eliminated, and the part of T4 not converted in T3 are recycled in the iodine blood block. The first submodel, the thyroglobulin, represented the thyroglobulin as a direct variation of the T4 released in the blood by means of the QT4 TGM term. In this slide, we have the TRH and TSH sum models, representing the negative control feedback of the model. We have that the TRH depends on the T3 and the T4, the TRH production, while the TSH production depends on the TRH in the blood compartment and the TRH in the delay compartment. Physiologically, we have said that both the TRH and the TSH depends on the T3 and T4, but in the model, this interaction is simplified. So, uh, it is assumed that the T3 and T4 uh, um, interacts only with the TRH production, that in turn interacts with the TSH production. Now, we we'll see the model equations, starting with the biological oscillator, composed by three equations. The third variable, x3, uh, represents the pulsatile part of the TSH, producing about 12 pulses a day. In this slide, we have the TRH and TSH sum model, composed by five equations. TRHB, that is the TRH in the blood compartment. TRHHN, that is the TRH in the hypothalamus, and N stands for normalized. TRH delay N, representing the previous variable, but delayed. The TSH, that is the TSH in the blood compartment, and TSHN representing the previous variable, but normalized. In this slide, we have the iodine sum model composed by five equations. We have the IB, that is the iodine in the blood compartment. NIS, uh, representing the sodium iodide importer activity. IE, that is the iodine in the extracellular compartment. TPON stands for the thyroperoxidase normalized and ID, that is the iodine in the thyroid. Uh, in order to, um, to consider the daily uh, iodine assumption, we have to consider a gastrointestinal model. Uh, I'm not reporting the equation for the gastrointestinal model, but are very simple, are only two, one for the stomach and one for the ileum. In this slide, we have the T3 and T4 sum model composed by 15 equations, part in this slide and part in the, no in the next slide. We have the TSH FN, that is the TSH effect on the secretion and production of the hormone. TSH F delay N, that is the previous variable, but delayed. And now a series of equations that are equal for both the T3 and the T4. The formulation for the T4 is in the next slide. So I explain the meaning of the, of the variable one for the both formulation. So T3D and T4D, that are the hormones stocked in the thyroid. T3P and T4P, that are the hormone in the production compartment. T3E and T4E, that are the, homes, the hormones in the extracellular compartment. T3B and T4B, representing the hormones in the blood compartment. T3BN, T4BN, representing the previous variable, but normalized. And FT3 and FT4, that are the, the free part of the hormones in the blood compartment. In the T4 formulation, we have, in addition, the T4 delay variable, representing the part of T4 converted in slow way in T3. In this slide, we have the thyroglobulin sum model, composed by two simple equations, TGN, that is the thyroglobulin in the extracellular compartment, and TGB, that is the thyroglobulin in the blood compartment. The model includes 30 equations, 22 differentials, and 8 algebraic. 141 parameters, in which 48 are determined, 
and optimization procedure, 14 parameters are left free, while the others are calibrated and taken from the literature. In the tables in this slide and the next two are reported all the parameters of the model, all 141 parameters, including the starting time for numerical integration, the time integration step, the initial condition for the state variable, etc. And we can see that we have a lot of parameters. Okay. The validation starts with data from Blackslay et al, where Yotaroid volunteers underwent administration of three doses of levothyroxine, 400, 400 alpha, 600 milligram, in order to evaluate the TSH, T4, and T3 responses. Wash out periods of at least 44 days separate each of the three experimental tests. T4, T3, TSH blood concentration data were not reported for each individual, but were given as average values for all patients. The model was adapted to experimental data through an optimization process for parameter estimation, the width at least square method where the weights are the inverse of the squared expectations. In this slide, we have the TSH, T4, T3 plasma concentrations of the model prediction blue line against the observed data points and red asterisks in a five days of simulations um, after a 400 milligram of levothyroxine administration. In the time axis, zero corresponds to eight and a half a.m., uh, 20 to four and a half a.m., and etc. In the first figure, we have the TSH plasma concentration, and we can see the pulsatile part of the TSH, and uh, this is due to the biological oscillator. And we can see that the pulses, the amplitude of the pulses of the TSH in the morning are smaller than in the night. And this represents an innovation for a um, thyroid model because the other thyroid models in literature doesn't consider the pulse other part of the TSH, representing it as a simple sinusoid. In the center, we have the T4 plasma concentration, and we can see that after the levothyroxine administration uh, 24 hours, the T4 quickly, incre quickly increase, while the amplitude of the oscillation of the TSH degrees reduce, and this is due to the negative control feedback. The third figure, T3 plasma concentration, doesn't appear so much dependent from the uh, levothyroxine administration, probably because the subjects are euteroid, so the T3 is already in its physiological range. In this slide, we can see the same, but after an administration of 400 alpha microgram of levothyroxine, and this slide, the same, but after 600 milligram of levothyroxine administration. The next steps include the addition of a sum model for the thyroid volume description for those diseases that consider a volume variation, as the hypothyroidism, the tumors, etc. Uh, the development of a minimal version of the model, considering all the most important players, as the T3, the TSH, and the T4, so not considering anymore the, for example, the TRH is simplifying the negative control feedback and not considering anymore the idem sum model. So, assuming that the subject assumes every day the necessary quantity of iodine and the minimal version of the model will be faster in terms of uh, time of simulation. And this is good. And more, the development of a sum model for the description of the autoimmune thyroid disease disease lies like uh, the Hashimoto, for example, and the development of a sum model describing the metabolic hormone alterations due to the pregnancy. And that's all. Thank you for the attention. Yeah. Any questions? No? no? Yeah. And run away. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of worried. No, I fit in only 14 parameters. Yes, but you got the result for the other 126. The other parameters are taken from the literature, a part are uh, determined, so they are related by, mm, by the other parameters. They are not independent. I'm more they are dependent. <laughs> Thank you.
I am Giulia Fiscon, I am assistant professor at Sapienza University of Rome, but also research associate to Yasi Institute of CNR. And uh, today I will talk to you about SafeRunner, this uh, network-based algorithm for uh, proposing uh, drug repurposing opportunities. First of all, uh, what is drug repurposing? Uh, is uh, a, a recent strategy to um, find a new uh, therapeutic purpose for, for already approved drugs saving uh, really time and money respect to a, uh, the novel drug discovery. And for drug repurposing strategy, really promising insight came from this new um, paradigm that's called the uh, network medicine, which proposes uh, an holistic approach uh, in which the diseases uh, are seen as a uh, network of gene really interconnected uh, respect to single independent ent um, entities. And according to this paradigm, we can say that the uh, integrated network of all the physical interaction that occur in a cell, that is known as human interactum, could be seen as a map in which the molecular determinant of a disease, that are called a disease gene, uh, tend to clusterize and uh, co-localize in specific regions that are known as disease module. And is the uh, perturbation on this module that causes the um, pathological uh, phenotypes, so they contribute to the manifestation of the pathological phenotypes. And in this sense, also the action of a drug could be considered as a local perturbation on this human interactum, uh, and thus for a drug to be uh, effective on a disease, uh, its target protein should be in the nearby of the corresponding disease module in the human interactum. And with this in mind, uh, we developed uh, SafeRunner, that is a network-based uh, uh, algorithm uh, for drug repurposing uh, for that quantify the interplay between the drug target and the disease gene in the human interactum by implementing a new um, similarity measure that rewards those associations that are in located in the same uh, uh, network neighborhood. The algorithm has been uh, uh, developed in R, so here you have also the link to, to download the, the source code, and it's freely, uh, freely available. Um, the uh, idea so, uh, that's uh, behind the uh, safe runner lies on the hypothesis that the um, target of a drug and the um, gene associated to a disease, when mapped on the human interactum, uh, could be uh, near. Okay, we quantify this uh, uh, vicinity, this proximity, uh, like a, um, a very short spot between the drug module and disease module. But SafeRun implement this uh, concept through several steps. The first one, uh, you don't see the point, okay. The first one, the uh, left part of this slide, um, consists in the uh, computation of the proximity measure, and then we assign also a statistical significance to this measure by considering a, a degree preserving randomization procedure. But then we adjust this uh, similarity value uh, by considering uh, a clusterization of this network and rewarding those drug and disease that fall uh, in the same cluster. Uh, ending up with, uh, after some uh, normalization procedure in order to have a measure between 0 and 1, uh, SafeRunner end up with a, a bipartite network in which we have drug and disease that are connected if there is a statistical um, significant association between them that are statistically proximal in the human interactum and the weight of this, uh, um, of this interaction is represented by this novel uh, network-based similarity measure. Uh, we um, apply uh, those algorithm to study the uh, 14 diseases from uh, a really widely used um, uh, database uh, that is Phenopedia, but also uh, the um, 300 human proteins came from the interacting with SARS-CoV-2 protein uh, that we downloaded from the um, Nature study uh, of 2020, and also we consider the drug target from uh, drug bank. Uh, basically, we study 14 diseases that was related to COVID-19, for example, for highly genetic similarity like severe acute uh, respiratory syndrome, and for which we have uh, we had at the time uh, the um, widely knowledge about the disease the gene associated to this disease, um, respect to COVID-19 that was really um, emerging uh, disease. And then also uh, other disease that was uh, associated to COVID-19 for uh, um, comorbidity, like uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension. 
and other, uh, um, uh, another disease like viral infection, immune disorder, for which uh, uh, some drug was also proposed to shorten the recovery time of uh, COVID-19 patients. And uh, we test uh, uh, more or less 200 of uh, uh, drugs that, we, uh, that, was, um, that were uh, um, approved by uh, the FDA, but also some combination of these drugs suggested by Spallanzani, with, uh, which collaborated at that time. Uh, the um, final network that um, Safran released uh, is composed of, uh, um, is here uh, um, represented like an heat map, in which you can see the 14 diseases that we uh, analyze on the, on the row and the repurposable candidate on the, on the column that are uh, colored according to the original therapeutic indication uh, and each cell represents the association of the disease and the drug uh, colored according to this uh, um, adjusted similarity measure uh, increasing from blue to yellow so meaning that uh, yellow spots are the one with the highest association highest similarity what we can observe uh, is that uh, as probability of safe runner, we recover some well already known association, for example, either cycloquine and chloroquine that was assigned to, um, associated to treat malaria, or also uh, tocilizumab associated to remote arthritis. But if we clusterize, for example, on the row and column, the um, drug and disease, uh, two main clusters came up uh, that are the one including uh, SARS and all the other uh, viral infection and the other one including all the comorbidity like uh, cardiomyopathy, hypertension uh, and, uh, and the other one. The um, association of original medical indication is, that is uh, listed here in the, on, the, on the right is represented by, is downloaded from the therapeutic da target database. Uh, this is the um, network in which we uh, say Brunner predict more or less 300 of drugs that were possible for SARS. This is a, a sketch in which we say the SARS uh, and connected to the other 13 diseases through the uh, highly confidential drug colored according to their original medical indication. Uh, here you can say the, uh, we can say that we have two types of nodes, the disease that are the red one, scaled with the number of uh, associated disease gene to each uh, disease, and the smaller one that, represented by the, that are represented by the drug. Uh, we can say that the uh, um, SARS was uh, uh, connected through um, several drugs to the other, shared by the other disease, like for example, uh, drug used for treated hypertension, uh, like enalapril, or uh, cardiovascular disease, like heparin, uh, that are also placed on, the, um, on this graph, on the, on the right of this slide, in which we can see all the uh, repurposable drug for SARS with their original medical indication on the colon, and the hypertension and cardiovascular disease appear as the most uh, frequent one. If we can uh, uh, explore the uh, neighborhood of each uh, uh, target of the drug that uh, say Brunner uh, predicts for, um, uh, for SARS-CoV, we can explore which are the molecules that could be affected by the, the, this drug. Uh, here in all these uh, ne subnetwork, you can we can see the um, disease associated gene that are to SARS, that are the, um, the circle, the red circle, and the drug target that are the, the blue square. Uh, in all this uh, subnetwork, uh, is, uh, um, there is a prevalence of uh, uh, immune inflammatory response with the pro inflammatory cytokines, but also the individual genetic factor uh, like the major histocompatibility complex, uh, like the HLA gene. Uh, and also, uh, what we can observe is that the complexity of each subnetwork does not scale necessarily with the effectiveness of a drug. For example, the remdesivir one, that is the D panel, uh, is a poor network, but this could be due to the incompleteness of the human interaction and also the partial knowledge of, uh, for example, in this case, uh, um, target uh, in human, because remdesivir is uh, known to um, interact with viral protein and non-human protein. But also, for example, for what concerns the heparin, the complexity of this network perfectly match with its role of anticoagulant drug, antiviral, anti-viral, anti-inflammatory. 
Also, we found other drug, or the most crowded drugs about COVID-19, like the anti-AZ inhibitor. Uh, and even here, or anti-JK and H1, so histamine, uh, even here is the presence of uh, chemokines, interleukins, uh, and all pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, um, represent the, the component of uh, inflammatory response that could be affected in this uh, in this uh, regard. We also, um, of course, uh, uh, test the safe runner for uh, accuracy uh, by using a rock standard uh, curve analysis, uh, by using the known disease uh, drug disease association uh, came in from the therapeutic target database, and you can say that the algorithm achieved over the 70 percentage of accuracy in recover some already known association. When we, uh, at the, um, we studied the SARS-CoV, as I already told you, because uh, there is a widely established knowledge, but also in, um, at the end of 2020 came uh, this article in which uh, uh, the author identified 300 of uh, human proteins interacting with SARS-CoV-2. So we run again uh, the software, and we, um, even if it uh, was in, uh, uh, not in lung tissue, but in kidney, they find them. But we rerun the, uh, the software and uh, we say that COVID-19 following the same cluster of uh, SARS and other viral uh, infection uh, that are uh, separated by the other uh, cardiovascular one. Um, for with the algorithm predict uh, 100 of, uh, of drug that are also shared with the um, SARS-CoV uh, for 50% of them. And also some specific one like lopinavir or cetrizine that were then tested for uh, clinical trial. So affirming also uh, safe runner as a good framework to a repurposable drug. Uh, in the last years, we also applied this software, software to study neurodegenerative diseases, in particular in collaboration with uh, Cinzia Volonté of uh, CNR and the Fondazione Santa Lucia. Uh, and even here, uh, we found a really interesting compound uh, for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and multiple sclerosis regarding the um, histaminergic um, pathway that we published on uh, neurotherapeutics, and the other one is uh, submitted for, uh, for publication. So thank you for your attention. These are the main uh, uh, reference of Save Runner, the code and the application, and uh, thank you also uh, to you uh, and to other other um, research collaborator to this work. Again, if there are questions, there are two minutes. Yes. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, approach. Ah, uh, thank you. Know, yes. Uh, of course. Yes, so you want to refine the, the drug that we predict, of course, so we have the a score associated to each uh, association that we can say, uh, we can prioritize those drugs that have a um, highest similarity, for example. Uh, but of course, uh, the algorithm, if you are interested in some drug that, for example, is not present on uh, drug bank uh, repository, uh, we can uh, personalize your query with the drug that you are interested in for, for example, if you know the target of this drug, for example. But the, at the end of the, um, uh, the, the final network that is provided by Save Runner also assigned its score. This, uh, similarity is like a score that you can assign to, to say which is the most uh, similar, uh, that, that means most proximal to the disease that you are uh, interested for. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's a pleasure for me to be here and I would like to thank the organizer of this very interesting meeting for giving me the opportunity to share my work. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about the development and new approach for the detection of the SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 is a positive stranded RNA beta coronavirus and uh, is composed mainly by four structural protein and the most famous one is the spike protein. Uh, the spike protein can can interact with the human ACE2 receptor, and this is important for the first step of the virus infection. But also this protein can be recognized by the antibodies developed after infection or vaccination. From a structural point of view, the spike protein is a trimeric protein, and each monomer is composed by different 
domains. The most important one is the RBD or receptor binding domain because it's in directly involved in the interaction with the ACE2 receptor. The ACE2 receptor is a dimeric single pass type 1 membrane protein that is also composed by a peptidase domain that is directly involved in the recognition and binding of the spike protein and a collective like domain that is mainly responsible for the dimerization of the, um, of the receptor. SARS-CoV-2 shows a high rate of mutation that, uh, that ha has caused the spread of several various variants during the last two years of the pandemic. The current um, variance is the Omicron one, and uh, the virus variants accumulate mutation mainly on the four structural proteins, in particular on nucleocapsid and protein and on the spike protein. The majority of the rapid tests are based on antibody, recognize the nucleocapsid protein, and this, of course, has an impact on the sensitivity of these rapid tests. As you can see in this picture, <clears throat> for the Omicron variant, we have a very low sensitivity of these rapid antigenic tests. So uh, um, based on this evidence, we also know that the variants are still able to interact with the ACE2 receptor. So our idea was to develop an, an approach to detect the virus based on the ACE2 instead of antibody. So basically, what we have done is to, uh, is a we want to reproduce in a biosensor what normally happens in nature between the virus and, the, and its receptor. To do that, we have chosen the, um, as a bioanalytical sensor, the graphene, graphene field effect transistor, or GFED, that is a well-established technology in the field of biosensor. So uh, the GFET transduces a biological signal into an electric signal. Basically, we have a voltage curve. And when we have a binding between the target protein and the bioreceptor, we have a shift of this curve. In particular, we have a shift of the Dirac point that represents the minimum conductance of the graphene. Uh, we, uh, in our work, we have used a commercial chip that is composed by 12 GFETs. This means that we can acquire to have signal from one single sample. Each GFET is composed by three different electrodes, the source, the drain, and the gate. There is also the PBS buffer, that is the liquid gate acting as a solution, um, a ionic solution for the charges flow. And um, we have used a um, linker molecule to attach the, the, the receptor on the surface of the, of the, the of the graphene, and we have used the P base, that is a, a, a hetero bifunctional molecule that is able to establish a pipe interaction with the graphene and covalent bonds with the primary amine of the amino acid composing the, the receptor. Um, it's important to remember that after a specific cleaning protocol, a GFET can be reusable. Okay. So our, uh, our um, protocol um, and experimental setup is divided, by, uh, is divided in different steps. So we have basically the GFET functionalization and the sample acquisition. Then we have a signal acquisition. Um, as, sorry, the sample incubation, then we have a signal acquisition. And to do that, we need several instruments, such as a semiconductor analyzer and a probe station. Of course, this equipment is not suitable for a, a real application in a, in a hospital. So what we have done at the beginning of this uh, project, we, um, to test our hypothesis, I mean, the, the, the possibility to use the ACE2 receptor instead of the, the antibody, we have checked the strength of the, the interaction between the receptor and the antibody. Uh, to, to, <coughs> to solve this question, we have run several um, uh, still the MD simulations in order to calculate the force of the interaction and what we, uh, have, uh, we have obtained is this graph and basically the, the, the strength of interaction is around 500 piconewton and it's comparable uh, between the uh, ACE2 and the antibody. This means this is a confirmation that uh, the, uh, of our hypothesis that we can use the, the ACE2 receptor instead of antibody. So then we have, um, uh, we have analyzed the electrical performance of the GFET functionalized 
in one case with the soluble portion of the ACE2 receptor and in the other case with the antibody. We have used as a control the, M -pro, uh, M -pro, uh, the, the main protease of the SARS-CoV-2 that is another protein of the virus that is, that is not involved in the binding with the ACE2 and neither with the antibody. So using the soluble portion, we were able to detect the virus at a concentration of 2 microgram ml. Using the antibody, we are able to detect the, the spike protein uh, at concentration of 0.2 microgram ml. This means, this means that the antibody anti-spike was better than the soluble portion of the ACE2 receptor. So at this point, the question was, how can we uh, improve the ACE2 ability in recognizing the, the spike protein? So we know um, that the, 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 the receptor, to be functional, must be a dimer. And we don't know if only the soluble portion is enough to keep the, the, the dimeric conformation of the receptor. So to improve the propensity of the receptor in maintaining the, the, the dimeric conformation, we decided to join the FC domain of the antibody that is characterized by the presence of several cell bridges, uh, of several um, uh, several interactions that stabilize the, the, this, this portion with the soluble portion of the, um, of the ACE2 receptor. In this way, we have created a chimera and we, we have called it S2FC. Uh, to, to prove, again, uh, from a theoretical point of view, um, the, 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 our theory, we have uh, we run three different simulations in which we have embedded the, the structure of the ACE2 receptor in a double, lip, double lipid bilayer, and um, we have also simulated the chimera and the soluble portion of the uh, ACE2 receptor. As we can see in this movie, the chimera is able to maintain the dimeric conformation comparable to the uh, reference uh, system, which is uh, the ACE2 in membrane while the soluble portion is not able to maintain the dynamic conformation. So then we have proved this um, running different, different experiments. In particular, we ran an SDS page electrophoresis in presence or absence of beta mercapto ethanol. And basically, when we are in a, a reducing condition, the, <coughs> the H2FC run as a monomer. When we are in, not in a reducing condition, the, the protein run as a dimer. Uh, on the other hand, when the, the, the soluble portion uh, is not affected by the reducing condition. Uh, so at this point, we tested uh, the, the chimera on the, on the um, biosensor, and we obtained, and we uh, um, use as a control not only the M-PRO, but also the uh, spike protein from the MERS virus. And using the ACE2FC, we detect the spike, we were able to detect the spike, the spike protein at concentration of 0.02 nanogram ml. This means that the chimera works significantly better than the antibody, anti-spike. So we have 0.02 nanogram ml versus 0.02 to microgram ml. So now, that the next step was how we can use this technology in, in, in a real application. So we designed a um, testing board and also two different orders, one for the board and one for the chip. So we were able to move from this large lab equipment in a very small point of care device. And the total size of this device is 20 centimeter. We were able to test this device in, in the hospital with the real samples. So bef uh, um, the first thing that we have done is the, uh, that we decided to test isolated virus using this point of care device. And in particular, we tested seven different samples. Uh, we have used as a control the herpes virus. So we didn't uh, get any signal when we used the herpes virus. While when we used the, the, the the culture virus, we can have a very nice signals. In particular, we were able to detect all different variants. Then we have done exactly the same, but running, uh, but, but testing the swab coming directly from patients. And we, uh, we have tested 12 samples. The, the first three, the three of them were negative, so we didn't get any signals. The other were positive with different CT values and 
we were able to detect all the variants, in particular Omicron BA1 and Omicron BA2, that is the current variant. And then the, the important thing is that uh, for, for our approach, we don't need any preprocessing step for uh, the, the samples. So in conclusion, our novel biosensor put the basis for a class of high sensitive, fast, reusable, and variant robust SARS-CoV-2 detection system. And we believe that this is not only related to COVID, this technology, because just, change, just changing the bioreceptor on the graphene, we should be able to detect other viruses or protein or exosome for um, bi liquid biopsy applications. Um, we are working on the um, version 2.0 of the point of care device. Uh, this includes uh, uh, reduced size and um, intellig uh, artificial intelligence directly on board on the, on the device to improve the sensing and a simple app to manage the signal acquisition and, uh, and the results. I would like to thank all the collaborators of this project coming from different institutions. In particular, I would like to thank Alice Romagnoli, Mattia D'Agostino, and Eleonora Pavoni that are the engine of this project, and of, and of course, all of you for the attention. Okay, so um, let me start my uh, brief communication by thanking all the, my, my um, collaborators who are listed here, um, and also acknowledging the, our host institutions. As you can see, uh, there are a lot of logos because this uh, is like a quite a large collaboration with uh, um, several institutions in Paris and in the US. Um, and yes, this will be the third uh, talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but I, I think it will be uh, quite different because it's another point of view. So uh, it will be interesting, I hope. So. Um, I will start from uh, this uh, cartoon, which is about uh, the viral, vir viral uh, life cycle. So you see there is a uh, um, virus entering a host cell, and then what the virus does basically is uh, um, exposing its genetic material within the cell so that it can rely on the uh, translation machinery of the, uh, the cellular uh, host translation machinery to produce uh, proteins and replicate itself so that uh, uh, new viral particles will be created and they will go out and infect other cells. But now, of course, uh, uh, the cell would like to stop this infection from happening and from proliferating. How can you do it? How can it uh, do that? Uh, one way is to clearly understand that there is some non-self RNA inside the cell, but actually the problem is that the building blocks of the viral RNA are the same of the uh, legitimate host RNA that can be there. So they are the four uh, nucleotides, right? However, there, is, there are some patterns which are used by the virus, viruses in general, and not very much used by the hosts. For instance, the, virus, the viruses need to have these uh, long double-stranded regions in their uh, uh, RNA or DNA um, in, to, to, have a to have some secondary structures. And so for this reason, uh, hosts can develop a uh, defense mechanism which look for this kind of uh, structures. And then if they are present in, in, the, in the cytoplasm, say, they trigger an immune response. However, here we will consider another uh, motif, which is more surprising at first, which is the presence of a cytosine followed by a guanine in the, in the RNA, which is a, the so-called CPG motif. Okay? Now, these motifs are actually, um, um, we, have, uh, we as human in particular have a lack of CPG motifs in our uh, genome, and there are several possible explanations concerning the fact that they, they, there, are, there are chemical reasons to think that uh, they are likely to mutate into T, the, the, the C into a T, and for this reason we, we don't have many of them in our genome, well, in the part of, the, of our genome that is transcribed. Um, so when a virus arrives, if it has a lot of CPG motifs, it can be recognized as non-self and then a, a reaction can be triggered. However, of course, the virus doesn't like to be spotted, right? So uh, it will evolve and it will uh, try to mimic, right? to mimic uh, the, the, it's, it's way, the way of its host of using the, the nucleotides. And this is called the viral mimicry. 
Uh, and for instance, in this uh, work in 2014, the authors showed that uh, uh, the H1N1 influenza virus jumped from the pro probable avian host to the humans with a lot of CPG motifs in its genome, and it, lo it lost uh, in a predictable way uh, the CPG motifs uh, on quite long time scales. You see, uh, it required uh, almost 100 of years to lose a bit of CPG um, content. Mm. And here you can see that uh, the model uh, assumed that the virus is evolving toward an equilibrium point. And we can understand which are these equilibrium points because they are uh, the CPG content, for instance, of viruses which evolved in contact with the host for a long time. Here, there is the example of, of influenza B. So we wanted to do something similar for SARS-CoV-2 genome. And this can be interesting for several reasons, starting from for the, the fact that the CPG motifs sometimes are, um, could be associated to some symptoms of the disease. Uh, and so it would be nice to understand how this is evolving. And also, uh, the CPG motifs are used to optimize the immune response in vaccine strains. So it is interesting to understand how many we should put to have an optimal response in some sense. So I will show you the results on the SARS-CoV-2 genome, but let me first um, uh, explain you a technical, with a technical slide what we did. I, I think this is interesting because this, uh, in general, this workshop is in between physics and biology, and this is actually the, the physics, the part from physics, okay? Um, in particular, we used a model coming again from this uh, very nice work in 2014, uh, where we wanted to assign, uh, to, to the model assigns a probability to each uh, uh, nucleotide sequence coding for a fixed amino acid sequence. So whenever we have a um, coding nucleotide sequence, we can split it in group of three uh, nucleotides. These are called the codons, okay? And uh, there, are, uh, there, are, there is the possibility of multiple codons coding for the same amino acid. For instance, here I have listed the four codons coding for alanine. Now, there is this uh, nice thing that different organisms tend to use uh, these uh, so-called synonymous codons with a, um, organism dependent probability. And so uh, you can use this probability to have a null model and to assign a, prob uh, a probability to the full coding sequence just by multiplying the probability of each individual codon. And this is an independent model describing each uh, codon. And to, uh, to this model, we added a term here, uh, which uh, count, it's a term which depends on the number of CPG motifs times uh, this uh, parameter f that we want to infer. And this parameter is actually a parameter that uh, gives us an idea of uh, what is the additional pressure in the genome to uh, have to gain or lose CPG motifs. Um, to, we want to infer this, uh, uh, this parameter, and to do that, we uh, maximize the probability of the observed coding sequence. And to do this, in, part in particular, we need to estimate this. Uh, um, this normalization uh, Z, which is called partition function in physics. And uh, to do this, we actually exploited some uh, physical, physically, some technique borrowed from physics, which is called the transfer matrix method. It's, it's a technicality, I will not explain it, but it's, uh, it's nice that we used this, this, uh, this overlap. So, the results. We took the SARS-CoV-2 genome, and we started, I mean, since it's a very, very long genome, we took a sliding window, and we started uh, inferring our um, F, so the parameter that I told you about, so, which is the, this thing that quantifies the CPG content uh, in this sliding window. And you see here, uh, in red, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, CPG force along the genome, and there are two, re two regions at the very beginning and the very end of the genome where the CPG force is very high, and it, you see below the other curves uh, from other viruses, uh, it is comparable to uh, the CPG forces of SARS and MERS, which, uh, as we know, jumped uh, to the human host recently, while in a very large part of the genome, the CPG force is actually quite low. It is, it is more comparable to HKU1, which is a common cold coronavirus. Okay? And so we have this uh, large heterogeneity of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 force, and this is nice because it allowed us to do some prediction about what the, how the virus will evolve in contact with the human being. In particular, 
uh, we uh, computed an equilibrium force uh, as it was done for the uh, influenza by computing the CPG uh, force for uh, the set of uh, human common cold coronaviruses, and this is the dashed line here, and to from uh, and comparing the force computed with this sliding window on the SARS-CoV-2 genome, we can say that there are some regions where we expect the CP mutations to uh, happen so that the CPG content is lost, and these are shaded in blue, and other regions where we expect the opposite to happen. And then we collected the 50,000 sequences, more or less, uh, uh, collected in the first uh, year of pandemic, and we observed the synonymous mutation, so the mutation which did not change the, uh, the amino acid, the corresponding amino acid, and we uh, counted in, in each sliding window uh, the number of CPG increasing mutation and CPG decreasing mutations. And we observe that there is some uh, correlation, as you can see. And in particular, if we take a sliding window and we plot uh, the uh, number of CPG increasing or decreasing mutation against the CPG force that we inferred, we obtain these two clouds of point here. And I, th I think it is nice that uh, the point where two, these two clouds cross, more or less, um, is the point where the number of CPG decreasing and increasing mutation are balanced, and this actually corresponded uh, roughly to the same equilibrium force we estimated from, uh, from uh, common cold coronaviruses. And so we were happy and we wanted to push it uh, even further, and so we introduced uh, a more dynamical model that we can use to score synonymous mutations. We score, I mean, uh, we, we attempted to give a probability to a synonymous mutation to happen. And to do this, we used uh, uh, our CPG drive term, so the term that uh, takes into account this, uh, this, this uh, position-dependent uh, tendency to lose or gain CPGs, also, but, but also the viral codon bias, so the fact that the virus has its own codon bias, it, it, it likes to use some codons more than others for some reasons. Um, and another term which uh, it is well known that there are some, for chemical reasons, there are some mutations which are more likely to happen than others, okay? And so with this uh, little uh, theory, we can assign a score to each mutation and we can then compare the score with what we observed. Here I'm showing you the two different, say, genes of the, of the uh, virus, the nucleocapside and the spike. One of them, uh, we were predicting a an, an decrease of CPG over time, and one of them, uh, an increase of CPG over time. And in both cases, the mutations that we, the synonymous mutations that we observed in the first part of the pandemics, uh, are uh, actually are those with a higher uh, score, SMS, synonymous mutation score. Uh, with respect to the other possible mutations, uh, synonymous mutations that we never observed. And so there is also an area under the receiving operating curve here where we, uh, that we can use to, 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 to like I can use to try to convince you that we are actually able in, in some sense to predict, to predict the mutation that are likely to happen with respect to those that are not likely to happen. Uh, and so yes, this was more or less what I wanted to tell you. So the two main points are this uh, um, large variance in the CPG force along the viral genome and which is nice because it's also compatible with this idea that the virus emerged as a recombination of other viruses, uh, some of them more adapted to the human being, some of them less. And also uh, I try to explain that uh, this uh, framework borrowed from statistical mechanics can be also used to try to predict at least uh, up to a certain extent uh, synonymous mutations happening uh, during uh, the virus viral evolution in contact with the host. So with this, I would like to thank you and again advertise once more the uh, workshop that we are organizing in Paris at the end of June on roughly related topics. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here to celebrate and honor uh, Giorgio for uh, his invaluable contribution, which is far reaching, so well beyond his uh, specific work. and. Uh, we are discussing about biology, and the topic which I would like to discuss with you today is a, a short overview, uh, very short and say simplified of a growing field of research, which is trying to understand how how chromosomes are regulated, because you know all, all our cells have the same genes, the same DNA, and so why in one cell one gene is an act, is active, and in another cell the same gene is turned off, or why an oncogene which has been silent for for years suddenly turns on. 
And as you guess from the title of my, my talk, uh, we think that uh, this is in part controlled by phase transitions taking place in the nucleus of cells. Before going on, let me very briefly, uh, but I really want to do that, mention uh, my co-workers and that, in particular, those working with Naples and Berlin, uh, in particular, Andrea Carrello is going to talk after me, uh, Simona Bianco, Andrea Esposito, and Mattia Conte, who are the real driving force behind what I'm going to discuss. So, well, in the standard picture, we are used to think of, of our genome, of our DNA, as a string of characters uh, where, which is encrypted with information and that we have to decrypt. Uh, yet, in, in the last few years, uh, such a picture has dramatically changed. Uh, because you know, first of all, that uh, genes are only a very minor fraction of our genome, less than 2%. And it has been discovered that the so-called non-coding part of our genome, 98% of our genome, uh, includes special regulatory regions, the, those in green in my, my uh, cartoonish slide. They are DNA sequences which are needed to control the activity of genes. And the way they do so uh, is the one you see in my slide. They literally fold onto their target genes, and in this way they activate or repress that gene. And of course, that, that's immediately opening to two major questions. The first is, how can we measure that at a genomic scale? Because you have to think that such a 3D organization is involving 20,000 genes in each cell and their regulators, order of magnitude, four regulators per gene. So you can imagine what a formidable architect architecture is established within the nucleus of a cell. And second, what are the mechanisms whereby distal objects, such as a regulator and the gene, which can be one million bases apart, uh, recognize each other in a functional way in the nucleus of cells and then uh, interact. And so I will try to go into those two questions that I have five times, very shortly, just to give you an overview of this. And the, the main message, which can already close my talk, is there is a formidable architecture uh, that we are exploring and which, dictating, which is dictating the fate of single cells. So, first of all, a, a glimpse on the data that we have. And uh, to cut short a much longer story, I want to mention our technology to, to measure that genome-wide. Uh, this is a work done in collaboration with Anna Pompo in Berlin, and so, which I try to, to summarize for you, because uh, at the end, the fundamental co concept is the concept of statistical mechanics, or even statistics. Suppose that in a cell, you want to know whether, say, the red and green DNA dots are apart or in contact one with the other. Suppose this is the, the question. Then, the idea we had is the following. You cut a random slice through the nucleus, and if you think about it, it's very likely, and, and you measure what is in that slice, I mean, which portion of DNA is in, is in that slice. If you think about it, it's very likely that such a slice doesn't include any of the red and the green. Sometimes you have one of the two, but it is very unlikely that you have both, because in the example, I, the first example I have in my slide, you have to cut the equatorial slice to have both in, in, in that slice. However, if the two objects are interacting, so they're physically proximal, when you cut the random slice, typically it, is, it, it doesn't include neither the red nor the, uh, nor the green. But if you have one of the two, since they are now interacting, it's very, very likely that you find both. And so it's just a matter of cutting many slices and analyzing sequencing, the content of the slices, and with some statistics you can reconstruct the interaction probability, the single cell interaction probability. And this is the data you see on the far right of my slide, which is real data. Uh, this is the measure of how frequently every pair of cells in our entire genome enter in contact one with the other. And, uh, uh, the data you see are real, and uh, this is only a six megabase, roughly, uh, no, it's a couple of megabase region on chromosome six, but uh, it's real data, and you have similar data across the entire genome. And I think for all of us, the first thing you think when you look at this type of picture is that there are patterns, which means the organization is non-random, and 
uh, it includes precisely what I told you at the beginning, so the information of who is in contacting whom, at which rates, and so on. And to cut short a longer story, a number of groups, including ours, have been showing that such an architecture, such a 3D architecture, uh, is impacting the way genes are regulated, for instance, in differentiation, in, uh, in the formation of the brain, and so on. But I, I really have not the time to, to go in, in deeper detail. But, but the message is, is simple. The second question I left open, and I try to briefly address, is what are the mechanisms which produce such an, an astonishing self-organization of the system? And the idea that uh, we proposed uh, is, is pictured uh, in, in, again in a cartoon in my slide. In few words, suppose you have a particle, we would say physical, or a molecule, which can bind the gene and the regulator in my uh, toyish example. Well, if you think about it, if you add enough molecules, you then produce a field which produces a, a long-distance interaction. In fact, this is mediated by phase transition. And I want to try to, to, to highlight that in, 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 uh, again with, with a simple example. Suppose that you have a stupid toy model made of a polymer, which is a chain of beads, self body walk. But along that polymer, that should be a chromosome in my mind, along that polymer you have a binding sites dark red in my, in my slide, uh, for binders, which can bridge cognate binding sites. This is, at the end, a well-known self-interacting polymer. And so you know what to expect. And if you work out the phase diagram of such a simple system, uh, you, I think maybe to this audience there's not much to explain, but uh, you have two phases, two main phases. If, for example, the concentration of binders is below a threshold, there is no way your polymer is open, randomly fold. If instead the concentration of binders goes above a threshold, you have a coil to globule transition, and the system spontaneously folds in a globule. And so you see you are, you are spontaneously enhancing contacts. And with this type of ideas, if you think about it, it's easy to explain the patterns I showed you before. Because, and look at, please, at the bottom of my slide, if you have a block of polymer, technically speaking, or in simple words, a polymer, we have two types of binding sites, red and green. You have again a phase transition, but in this case you form two globules. Technically this is polymer micro phase separation, but no need to be technical. So you form two globules, which are roughly independent. And if you map the contacts in those two globules, uh, you get a pattern that you see is very close to what I showed you from the experiments. And so you start explaining the, uh, the complexity of patterns uh, seen experimentally. And in fact, I don't want to leave you with the impression that this is all, say, qualitative of end waving, but what we showed is that you can explain with this type of basic, uh, oversimplified models from physics, you can explain uh, contacts uh, genome-wide for uh, the entire human genome. And I'm showing you in this example uh, one region of the genome which is roughly six megabases, uh, six million base which is roughly one-tenth of a chromosome, and on the top you see real uh, contact data, and on the bottom what you get out of this type of models. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is just a fit. So I'm showing you that you can fit the data. But we wanted to, to test such, such a model. And so the idea I came up with is, is the following. Suppose you have your wonderful polymer model of the region of interest. You can implement a mutation in the model. And you can, if the model is correct, you can predict how the system refolds after the mutation. And you have no fitting parameters here. Either it is a good model or not. And if it is a good model, you can fully explain, you should be able to fully explain the data, experimental data, taken now in cells bearing exactly that mutation. And this is what we did in another approach of Stefan Mundlos, uh, across organisms, across cell types, in humans, in mouse, and so on. And systematically we found an agreement. Uh, this is briefly shown at the bottom of my slide. On, on, you say on the left and bottom you see the, the same region I showed you before, and uh, on the right you see two mutations. 
and on the top there is the model prediction and the bottom the experimental independently run data. And the agreement was, first of all, it was surprising to us because this is a very simplified model in principle. Uh, not to mention another number of complications you can have in real cells. But it is encouraging because we have no example of where it didn't work. And, uh, and so this is supporting the idea that the type of mechanism, phase separations I discussed, are likely to play an important role in the way how our chromosomes are folded and the way our chromosomes are controlled. And additionally, you see now we are in a position whereby out of polymer physics we can predict the impact of mutations. And the mutations you see in my example are not, in this case, random mutations. But you may have noticed that they have a phenotype they correspond to patients having a disease, a congenital disorder, limb malformations. And what our models predicted is why you have a phenotype, why you have a disease. And the reason is, is incredibly simple, though dramatic, because when you have those deletions, you know, those mutations, you see one is a duplication, another is an imper a deletion. When you have those mutations, what you do is to alter the way in which regulators and gene interact. And so you may have a genome which is intact in the sense that you have the genes there, but you have changed the network of contacts. And so the wrong gene is upregulated at the wrong time. And this is the case. I've not the time to explain. I'm showing you in this slide. And this leads to the disease. So final, uh, final slide is only uh, to give you again a sense of perspective of where this field is going into. And the point is, what are the molecules uh, which produce the interaction? Do we know them? And again, a combination of experiments and models, precisely as we do in physics, uh, can guide the search for the factors which mediate contacts. And to cut short a longer story, uh, we are start discovering, part of my group, part in other groups, uh, what are the factors which are involved. And I mentioned, of course, those we highlighted. <laughs> Uh, and to cut short the long story, one nice example is pol 2 itself. So the polymerase, which is a machinery, you know, for transcribing genes, appears to have a role in forming hubs of transcription where, where different co-transcribed genes co-localize, and so appears to be one of the factors, including others I've not the time to enter, uh, which produce those contexts. And so I thank you very much for listening, and if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. So, good evening to everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm a researcher uh, from the University of Naples. I work with uh, Manuel Nicodemi at the uh, FIX department. And I will tell you something more about how it is possible to study with polymer physics genome in healthy and pathogenic phenotypes. So basically, we all know, we are all used to think about the DNA as a linear sequence of uh, nucleotides, which in case of human, if you ideally stretch in space, you cover more or less two meters, okay? This system is very complicated because it undergoes to several level of uh, folding steps uh, up to fold this huge polymer in a nucleus which has a diameter of 5, 10 micron approximately for humans. But you can see that this organization is far from being random. As you can see from this um, image at microscope, uh, approximately dated 20 years ago, where each, you can say, uh, the, or you can see that the DNA tend to occupy a distinct region in the nucleus, which are the famous chromosomes, okay? Now, thanks to the improvement to, uh, of molecular biology technologies, today we're able to spy within uh, those regions uh, with the refined microscopy and biochemical techniques. And also, uh, along with that, we have uh, uh, more and more refined more polymer physics models that allow us to understand uh, this kind of data coming from these uh, experiments. And we can reconstruct the real structure within chromosomes as the one that I'm showing here, at the scales of some nanometers where the activity of the genes is explained. So basically, uh, this is something that already Mario mentioned before, but uh, 
um, to let you understand why it is important to, to uh, study the problem of a chromatin architecture, um, it's enough to understand this kind of mechanism whereby the genes are regulated. So basically, the genes are those sequences in DNA that encode for proteins, which are the uh, building bricks of life, uh, are, uh, along with genes, so we can identify on the genome other regulatory elements known as enhancers, okay, which um, uh, by means of this kind of mechanism can regulate the genes. So if you have two enhancers here, can you see the, the arrow? Okay. Uh, in this situation here, the genes are distant in space uh, from their enhancers and the gene is off, while in this case here, there is a spatial proximity and the gene is on. Now, uh, you know also that uh, in humans, for instance, we have uh, uh, 22,000 genes, and uh, the pattern of expression of those genes uh, basically define the tissue that we are considering. So, for instance, we have stem cells, muscles, blood cells, and neurons. And importantly, an altered activity of these genes can be linked to severe diseases as cancer or congenital disorders. So this is just to make you understand why it is important to uh, quantitatively study genome architecture. Now, uh, just a brief mention to the technologies uh, and to the experiment, uh, experimental data that we deal with uh, when we study genome architecture. So basically, uh, I mentioned this one, which is called the uh, IC technique, uh, which uh, um, from the physical point of view is not different as output to the uh, GAM data that Mario mentioned before. So basically, you start from a, popu a cell population, okay, millions of, of cells typically, uh, you, with the several biochemical steps, uh, you uh, come uh, uh, with this uh, kind of uh, data that you see here, which, which uh, correspond to chromosome 21 in particular. And this kind of data um, is a matrix where each pixel tells you uh, the contact frequency of distant site uh, pairs uh, along the genomic sequence. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, this uh, technology was, uh, uh, say, improved with uh, microscopy, and uh, um, the, the, we, we have a data structure similar to the one in SC, but uh, we measure, instead of contact frequencies, we can study, uh, we can have uh, spatial distances. And this is the STORM uh, technique, who's uh, an, ex uh, an example of data set is shown here. So, uh, if we consider three points, for instance, A, B, C, that you see along this diagonal here, uh, this pixel here will measure the uh, contact frequency of A with B, this one analogously the contact frequency of B with C, and of course, as we can see uh, from this color, color scheme here, the interaction of A with B is higher than B, with, uh, than B and C. Accordingly, the, in 3D space, the distance between A and B is uh, is uh, shorter than the distance between B and C. So, of course, the two technologies give uh, specular uh, information. Now, this is just to tell you the, uh, which kind of data we uh, deal with. Um, now, in order to quantitatively understand uh, what is the, physical, uh, the physics that this kind of data can tell us, we need a, uh, a model. Now, the model that typically we use is the one already mentioned by Mario, uh, actually proposed by Mario um, almost 10 years ago. So this model is called the Strings and Bandas Switch model, uh, which basically envisages a textbook scenario of uh, uh, chromatin uh, interaction within the nucleus. Uh, so basically, the chromatin is modeled as a filament made of a bit zone uh, by, uh, made of a string on a bit uh, standardly studied in molecular dynamics. Uh, on which you can identify binding sites that you see colored in red here, which can interact with binders that typically float in the nuclear environment. Those basically mimic the, uh, the plethora of proteins that you may have in the uh, nucleus, okay? So, uh, again, this model is, uh, can be studied, uh, for instance, with the massive parallel molecular dynamic simulations. The control parameters are essentially the concentration of binders and the interaction affinity. Uh, so basically, if we are below threshold, so low concentration, low, uh, low affinities, the polymer isn't able to form stable contacts, and we are in the so-called self-avoiding work configurations, as the one that you can see here. We can induce the transition by raising contact uh, concentration or binding affinity, so to have this kind of uh, globular object here. 
Um, here you can see magnified this kind of uh, uh, so-called colchromial transition. Uh, now the model can be studied under uh, different conditions. Okay, now this one is the most is the simplest one that you may imagine, but actually uh, you may have a multicolor string with which you can build more complicated topologies. With actually, um, with which we can reproduce real structures. Now, in literature, this mechanism here is uh, called the microphase separation. Uh, in the last period, uh, this kind of mechanism is also known in the microscopy uh, field uh, as uh, is also known as polymer polymer phase separation because basically the transition here is uh, due to the fact that you have interaction between polymer and binders. If you don't have the polymers, you, if the polymer you don't have the phase transition. So, um, taking advantage of these uh, uh, kind of models here. The idea, as Mario mentioned, is uh, uh, that we can consider the information contained in the experiments uh, that I mentioned before to reconstruct a population of real uh, a population of structures that uh, reproduce the architecture of a real locus. Okay, as in the as the one that you can see here. So to do that, uh, we in the group in Naples, the complex system group invented basically this algorithm here, which is an inference method, recursive inference method, which tells you the position and the number of binding sites, so this is to answer to your uh, question, um, that uh, uh, minimally explains the pattern of the contact that you can have here. Okay? Now this is just one uh, region, 6 million base pair of, the, of uh, along chromosome uh, 11, but uh, this uh, algorithm is absolutely general, ge uh, general, and you can use it for entire, uh, the entire genome. Actually, we did it for the entire genome. So, um, once we have uh, this population of uh, structures which, uh, which are a bona fide reconstruction of uh, a real genomic region, we can think to do a lot of uh, analysis, okay? Uh, even analysis that uh, uh, now are uh, not accessible by experiment. So think about the potential that this kind of uh, uh, method can have. So suppose that we derive our 3D, uh, our population of 3D structures, we can investigate, for instance, um, the basic uh, physics that those structures rely on. So the mechanism, as I said, of uh, phase separation, and we can also test uh, with experiment how these phys this, uh, physical mechanisms work. We can uh, think to go beyond the simple pairwise contact to infer, for instance, uh, um, distances, pairwise distances, and compare them with independent data, as the one that I mentioned before, and we also did it in uh, uh, those two uh, recent publications that you see here. We can think to explore higher order contacts so beyond the pairwise, we can go with the triplet and quadruplet also. Um, but also we can think uh, to application more, uh, say, biomedical inspired. Now, to this, uh, in this regard, I will show you uh, a, an application that we published on uh, uh, Nature Genetics three years ago, approximately, again in collaboration with the, the uh, group of professors Stefan Mundros and Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics in Berlin. So basically, we studied this locus here, called the PTX1 locus, where basically um, the, the contact map is uh, shown here for the four-limb tissue. The four-limb uh, tissue basically is the one that, uh, after the embryo development, will be the arm, okay? Um, analogously, we, this here is shown the data for uh, the so-called hind limb, which will be the legs. So we have arm and legs, and the 3D architecture for this locus here, the PTX1, in these two tissues, okay? Now, um, from the regula regulation point of view, the PTX1 gene is active in hind limb, but not active in fore limb, and this is because you have a contact between the PTX1 with pen, which is an, an answer, a property of this gene here, okay? Uh, this contact, you can appreciate it here in uh, red, while you cannot see it here. And this is also much more evident if you consider this subtraction matrix. Now, we applied our algorithm to reconstruct the 3D structure of the, in those two tissues, and what we discovered is that, in the four-limb case, you have a, we baptized it this way, this architecture, a two-hub architecture, you can see it here. So in the polymer, you can identify two hubs, okay, of interaction, where you have here the PTX1, and here you have the pen. So you can see that they are distant space. 
compatible with the fact that you don't have the contact in the experiment. Uh, whereas in the handling case, we have this three hub architecture, which brings in spatial proximity the uh, PTX1 gene with the pen. You can see that they are here. And um, uh, we uh, did also a, um, the modeling of a mutant species in the uh, four limb case, where basically we inverted this region according to the scheme that you see here. So basically we brought pen in spatial proximity uh, of a PTX1. Remember that here the gene is silent. And what we discovered is that we recover this three hub-like um, architecture, okay, similar to the hind lib. And indeed, the phenotype, which is uh, a, uh, let me say, a brown phenotype, is a so called a partial arm to leg transformation, okay, compatible with the fact that we are bringing uh, closer the architecture of hind lib to the four limb case. Uh, sorry, the arm uh, architecture to the uh, leg case. Um, how much time do I have? I left. Okay. One minute. One, so, okay, so I will I skip this. <laughs> okay, okay, great. No, I'm almost finished. So basically, uh, this is a, uh, another application that we uh, did. That we published uh, even this one in uh, different publication in, uh, three years ago, uh, again in collaboration with uh, those people in Berlin. I will skip this one because Mario already told you. So basically, we modeled and predicted correctly the refolding of uh, the genome in this uh, uh, region here, the FA4. You can see uh, how the prediction of the model nicely recapitulates the pattern of uh, interaction, so called the technically ectopic interaction, uh, which basically is associated with uh, those uh, uh, malformations, in particular brachydactyly and syndactyly. So, to conclude, let me also uh, mention this, uh, to tease you in some way, uh, this, uh, uh, this is an ongoing project actually. So, basically, we, used, and we are using this kind of methods to explore what happens when the genome is infected by SARS CoV 19 virus, virus. Okay, we're taking advantage of the recently uh, published data, they were published uh, six months ago, more or less. So, just to let you understand the, uh, the, the, how new those data are. So, we applied our model. Uh, which you can see recapitulate here. Um, this is a just one uh, uh, locus which contains a gene uh, which is a technically a pro-inflammatory gene, uh, which are important when basically a genome is uh, infected. What we can appreciate here uh, is that in the not infected case, COVID, uh, called mock here, uh, you can see that the pattern of interaction has this uh, intensity. Uh, conversely, when uh, uh, we infect the cell with the COVID, what is detected by those data? This is very interesting. You can see that the uh, interaction pattern is uh, reduced. So this is, uh, from the architectural point of view, what happens when a genome is infected by the COVID. And this has impact on the activity of all these genes. Uh, as I said, by running our uh, um, algorithm and subsequent molecular dynamics uh, simulations, as you can see here, we were able to recover this effect, as you can see underneath here, the correlation between the two pattern of interaction is very high, and you can also appreciate that by considering some minute de detail, details, as you can see here, so you can see this loop here, which is uh, much reduced here, and this is very well recapitulated by the structure here. Let me stress that here we rely on a uh, population of uh, structures, okay? So we have the 3D coordinates of each single structure that aggregated give this kind of uh, matrix here. So we can do all the things that I said at the beginning on this kind of data and discover, say, dig even more in detail what happens uh, upon infection of COVID. So to conclude, uh, we said that the development of molecular biology technologies uh, allow to investigate uh, genome with unprecedented accuracy uh, in parallel, the improvement of polymer physics models is allowing to understand the general principle, the physics that governs chromosome folding. When we combine the two, uh, the two say, um, experiment and theory in a synergic combination, we are able to quantitatively study genomes and, of course, make quantitative prediction for disease-linked uh, variants, and also 
uh, gene reconstruction upon viral infection. With that, I thank all my collaborators in uh, Professor Mario Ricodemi's group and all the people I have the honor to work with in Naples, all, my collabor all our collaborators uh, abroad, and of course, I thank you for your attention. I'm going to change topic. So from molecular biology, I'm going to bring you to molecular physics, if you like, or molecular medicine. And uh, I, have to, I have to do a disclaimer first. I'm also a distinguished lecturer, a white triple so I'm asked to present this slide when I started. Uh, I just want to bring you back to the medicine. Medicine started uh, as a chirurgic medicine, but uh, that was uh, many, many years ago. Then came uh, Mr. Hippocrates, then uh, made the big change because he started to classify medicine in the illness according to the symptoms. Still, it was a very, very not even qualitative. During the medieval age, it became qualitative, and then finally, with Galileo became quantitative. And uh, why I'm going to start from medicine, because medical physics is very much related to medicine, and medical physics has to be objective, reliable, and verifiable. And I will talk about the part where we build instrumentation for medical physics. Uh, let's say, what's the definition of medical physics? I take the definition of the IOMP, the International Organization of Medical Physics, and say it's a branch of applied physics, very good, pursued by medical physicists that use physics principle methods and techniques in practice and research for the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of human disease. Now, these two uh, prevention, these three things, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment are the three fields of medicine. So medical physics is strictly related to medicine. And uh, you can see here in this slide that there's a diagnosis, prevention, and therapy, and how they medical physics contribute to that. They, especially in imaging, in the last 50 years, it started, of course, with X-ray, but it's developed all the, the device in the last 50, 60 years, is radiological imaging, nuclear imaging, and radio protection. See it as the three items, and of course, radiotherapy. So it's, it's, it's in completely interconnected. And so let's say, then if this medical imaging, what we're talking about, medical imaging has various facets. One is morphological, and we go with the film, the CT, MRI, ultrasound, all these keys functional, so you're measuring the function of the body, and that's you have a geography, Doppler ultrasound for the heart, PET and SPET, so the positive emission tomography and the single photon emission computer tomography, MRI, and then it's nice to put the two things together, to put together the morphology, or if you like the anatomy with the functional, and you have the hybrid kind of thing, and then you finally go to the moleculars. Molecular, what what's, what's means molecular imaging? Uh, this again, I will use a definition by Gambier and Massoud, and say that the molecular imaging is a visual representation, characterization, and quantification, because that is mandatory, of the biological processes that take place in a living being at cellular or subcellular level. So this is a very, very much with this... Uh, workshop. We're talking about biological processes to be imaged in vivo. Now, what kind of uh, device do we have for doing this molecular? If you see, if you look at the, at the column of imaging technique, you have optical, or the bioluminescence, optical fluorescence, you have a positive emission tomography, single photon, MRI, CT, you know, CT just for morphology, and what is needed? What is needed? You have to have a high sensitivity. Otherwise, you don't have the molecular imaging. That doesn't mean that you, you, you image a, mo a molecule, but you have to have a sensitivity to measure something that is starting, it needed to be seen. And so, uh, you, you, there should be very nice to have optical that has a very high sensitivity, 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 
17 mole per liter. Uh, unfortunately, the light doesn't go to the tissue, it's very difficult to be used. And so I concentrate on the PET. The PET, the positive emission tomography, has a high sensitivity, high resolution, and uh, is well known in terms of physics. I think everybody knows that it depends derived from the, a positron that is emitted by tracing and the positron annihilates with an electron more or less back to back the two photons so they determine a line of light and from that a bit of reconstruction you go to the reconstruct the place where the positron has annihilated. I don't want to go into the physics, I want to show you the first image that was produced by my friends uh, uh, Phelps in uh, Los Angeles at, uh, at the end of, six, of the 60s with the first imaging of the, uh, of the brain uh, that was uh, taking desoxyglucose. Fluoro, this, uh, this was done with the carbon-11 desoxyglucose. Basically, the desoxyglucose is the precursor of glucose, so it tell, it's, it, it's uh, taken by the, by the brain where the necessity of energy, necessity of glucose. So the, this is the activation of the part of the brain. You can see that the, we look if somebody, if you, if you are looking now, if you uh, with interest to this slide, your activation is your on, on, on the ospe, ox, o, o, occipital region of the brain. If you are listening, maybe you are listening not to great enthusiasm to this lecture, but still, if you are listening, that is the lateral part that are activated. If your thinking is your is your for is a, is your your part in front of your of your brain, if you remembering is a lateral and on the and the back and this is a, well evidenced by the Alzheimer. And if you're working in the just do a manual work, see that your brain is at rest. That's why the, the, the manual work is is one of the of the therapy for instance for uh, people that have some problem, some mind problem. So this was the first one, and uh, this is a, a bit more modern with the application on the Alzheimer, I, again with the, uh, with the fluorodesosic glucose at this time, and you can see that the, the region where there is no glucose uptake on the Alzheimer is different from the normal, of course. Now the, there are traces that are more effective than this one, but this were the first one to be used. And the other one is the Parkinson disease, and you see that the receptor in the brain, one of the receptor is taking L-dopa, the dopamine, and the other the receptor does not, and that means that it is an enzyme. Again, now there is other trace better than that one. But let's see what, uh, uh, what is the, the beauty of the thing. The beauty of the thing is, uh, say, function are also moving. This, this is a, a rat. And this is a heart of the rat that is about two centimeter diameter. And you see that the, the heart of the rat is beating. This is done with the, with the with pet that we have built. We have built a lot of pet for small animal. And uh, it would be nice to see also where the lungs are. And then you do the hybrid thing, that the pet CT. And this is the image again of the pet CT where you can see also the 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 lung that uh, during the respiration and uh, you see the colored one is uh, instead the same probably the same rat no it's done in another place uh, still with the, with the scanner that we have built and distributed and that, the red one is uh, for for the uh, heart of this bidding uh, so this is the, this is the beauty you sense you know what it is and you know what's the function of course, this is a function where, for, for, art, for instance, you want to study if the heart has some ischemic or some, some problem. But let me tell a little bit further on the biology kind of thing. Uh, this is a tumor of the lung, you know, the three figure, but the tumor with the different behavior. The first one is uh, being looked at with FDG as a tracer. And then you see that uh, is uh, the deposit or the, the take, uh, take of the of the FDG is a standard. Probably this is the lung carcinoma. Then you have the one in the middle and see that the tracer is FLT. FLT is a tracer that tells you re speed of reproduction of the of the tumor. So this means that this tumor will be developing very fast. And so something must be treated in a certain way. 
But the, the third one is being looked at with the F meso. F meso is a tracer that concentrates where there is very little or no oxygen. Now, the tumor with no oxygen must be treated in a different way because the standard treating with, with, with gamma rays is not productive. And you see, for instance, what this brings, brings that uh, this is a, the tumor seen with F meso. And if you look the, the, the color one, when it is uh, red, yellow, and blue, that will be the optimized treatment to be done with particle something that could eventually be done at now uh, in Italy with oxygen, carbon and, and helium. Why two different particles? Because the amount of oxygen that is there is different. So this is really a, a, a guide for the treatment. Well, what's the problem with the PET? The problem with the PET is that this is small axial field of view is about 25 centimeters. So if you want to cover, for instance, the entire body, you have to do a scanner. And very simple to cure, because if the, instead of doing a small one, you make a large one. And now they started to build the total body pad. Total body pad, uh, about two meter, uh, is a bit too expensive. Okay, let's make one meter and 20 centimeter. That probably is enough to cover most important part of the body. Still, this, uh, expensive. I bought 8 million on the market for the 1.2 and 12 million for the 2 meter. So as a matter of fact we try at the moment as a group to build one that will be one, hopefully one third of the cost. But with the same advantage. And what is the advantage? Dynamic. Now that you remember the, the, the I have, I have two minutes, five minutes, one minute? No. Okay. I have some. I'm, I, 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 I almost, I almost finished. I almost finished. Don't worry. Uh, to me, oh, plenty of time. Uh, this is uh, what uh, I wanted to see. You see, you see the time: 38 seconds, 42 seconds, 50 seconds, one minute. Now you see the drug that go through from the injection through the body in one minute, not in 30 minutes like the standard. Because if if you compare what you've seen before, and you see this is a, this is a steady state, and the steady state is a. a after 30 minutes, you can see that in one minute you can really study the dynamic, the process, how the, the, the tracer is taken. Now, if the tracer is a biomarker, you can see like, the dynamic of the biomarker. You can have the biological information on the organ, on the district. So this is, a, is, a, is a, the importance of this type of thing. And uh, as I say, uh, it's, unfortunately, it's a bit expensive, but probably will be... Uh, let's see, the, the dividing line between physics and biology is at the present a rather sharp one. This was told in 1958. So uh, the next uh, uh, will tell you who, who, who said that. That was Tam, the Nobel Prize for Cherenkov together with Cherenkov. And then say, I venture to express the opinion that to achieve fundamental success in biology, a very close working cooperation of all three sciences, representative of which are honored by Nobel Prize, physics, chemistry, physiology, or medicine, will be indispensable. So that is a, what I think this workshop was part of, and that's it was, a, I am, am very uh, sustained. And uh, the, final light, the final slide brings you to Rembrandt, 1632, and uh, that was the anatomy lecture in 1632. So it was a post mortem, and it was uh, opening the, 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 the corpse and was indicating the uh, various organ. And uh, ask yourself what will be the anatomy lecture in 2030. I'm keeping updating. I, the first time I presented this was in 2010. Now I put it to 2030. And that's what it will be. Okay? Thank you very much. Oh, I hope you, you will like it. So, we are, changing, uh, we are changing topic again, in fact. 
In the last few years with my group, so we are a lot uh, into astrobiology, and part of astrobiology is a study about uh, the origin of life, which is a very, spe very speculative topic, in fact. And uh, we cover actually a, a range of subjects in astrobiology. We study chemistry of meteorites, uh, we study chemical differentiation in the solar system. Uh, this is about uh, uh, games of life, which is something we, we accelerated, in fact, we, our work in the, in the last two years. So, chirality, as uh, anyone knows, in fact, is uh, one of the most uh, nice uh, and uh, deep mystery about the na chemical nature of life. Uh, as you know, in proteins, for example, proteins later, I mean, molecules have uh, so-called uh, absolute chirality and uh, in principle life could use uh, any kind uh, of uh, these, these two possibilities or more possibilities but uh, in fact uh, what happens is that uh, in life uh, only one of the two chirality is used and uh, we don't know why there are uh, many, many theories about uh, this. Uh, they are very sound. Some theories, in fact, uh, um, prescript uh, the deracemization of, uh, of uh, would-be biomolecules uh, by chemical processes, physical processes, and uh, even astrophysical processes uh, occurred, for example, uh, in the primordial solar nebula. In our work, we stick to the so-called biotic deracemization mechanism. It is, it is based on the so-called world hypothesis, which is um, the idea that uh, in living organism, absolute, um, absolute chirality of biomolecules must conform for a series of reasons which have been discussed in many, many papers about the optimal functionality of these molecules. So it means that according to world hypothesis, world paper is a classical paper, quite old, is it a paper published in the 50s? Anyway, in a very early uh, age, there should have been possibly two kinds of life, one based on, uh, for example, L-amino acids and one based on D-amino acids, but uh, apparently the D-life disappeared. And so one wonders uh, wonder what happened to the other possible kind of life. Now, this is our, about our involvement. A few years ago, um, about uh, 10 years ago, in fact, uh, we observed that uh, in a very well-known model for artificial life, uh, which was developed uh, and quite fashioned uh, in the 90s, uh, in fact, it was, uh, very, it was very fashioned as a kind of game uh, at the time, uh, but it is, in fact, uh, one of the very first uh, artificial life uh, models uh, with uh, many features like uh, simplified metabolism, metabolism, genotype, very simplified genotype, and phenotype, and several kinds of organisms which may develop and compete for the environment. We observed that it was possible, now I can of course I have to skip all the details, it was possible to change something in this kind of model in order to mimic the possibility of the life and the life coexisting, but we always observed that they never coexist in a short time compared to Okay, it is possible to give a precise name, a precise meaning to short, but in short time, one of the two alternatives disappear from the simulation. The hypothesis is that it is due to anomalous fluctuation, which means that the probability distribution of populations in an artificial life scenario like this is has a very large variance, in fact has a kind of infinite variance, and because of this, as you see from the picture, extinction becomes a much more frequent event. 
However, Palmeter, uh, Palmeter artificial life model is, uh, is very slow. In order to, to observe a simulation, you have to wait a few minutes. And so it is not very suitable for a statistical analysis. So a couple of years ago, we started to develop simplified model, which were basically uh, based on the idea of uh, game for the simulation of life, uh, which is an idea of uh, John Conway, in fact, uh, Conway life model was kind of abstract, was a little strange, I mean, in this respect. I would say that uh, credit for the idea of uh, actually using game to simulate life goes to Eigen and Winkler with the famous book uh, about the use, use of the games, which was published in German uh, about uh, in the 70s. Now, in a life uh, two-dimensional model, which is a toy model which we started to develop a, 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 three years ago, you have two types of early replicators. The two types are equally fit, so environment uh, is, not, is not making any preference. Chemical energy is provided at a constant rate uh, and is used for a simplified, very simplified metabolism and because of the limited energy resources you observe uh, competition, which is not a direct. Uh, these uh, spe uh, sp uh, simulated species are not aggressive uh, toward one another, but of course uh, they feed uh, on the same food. So this is an example of uh, what you see when you run uh, a live program. Uh, um, the, the circle are uh, possible life forms. If the circle is white, the position is empty. Otherwise, you have two colors in this simulation for two kinds of replicators or primordial cells. The other colors are chemical energy available in the position at the time. The total population, and this is important, we never observe random extinction. We never observe. Uh, you, you may run this, pro this code, in fact, we, do, we did it for tens of thousands of time, you never observe random um, extinction, because the numbers are quite high. But we always observe selective extinction. One of the two species disappears, and it disappears relatively fast. In fact, it is possible to see that population differences arises, they are persistent, yet they are intermittent. Sometimes uh, you see something which is uh, persistent, but then you have a switch. But any simulation ends uh, with, uh, ex see, uh, with a selective extinction event. So, conclusion. We provide evidence, uh, maybe, that one of the two life forms carrying biomolecules of opposite chirality disappeared for a random event. The simulation is formulated as a computer game. Results, uh, not actually the results I'm showing to you, because I skip uh, all the you know, statistical analysis in order to save time, but it's published. Results show that strong fluctuations are involved, uh, and they are important. And uh, in fact, uh, if you need uh, more information, it is just, uh, the simplest way is just to go on the Google Scholar and look for the three keywords which are shown there. So I, I hope it was nice and that I thank you. So while 2 sat is polynomial, that means as the problem grows in size, the time needed to solve it grows polynomially, 3 sats problem is incomplete. That means that in essence, you have to explore two to the, all two to the n possibilities to find if there is a solution or not, just to answer the simple question. And in fact, it is one of the millennium problems. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, while two sat, uh, um, sat satisfied is a natural progenitor of all complex problems, because all complex problems. So you say this is a meeting in which physics and so mm -hmm. biology and medicine collaborate, but okay. it's pure physics. On the other side, we have to Sorry for. for Yes, okay. Uh, I will speak about the complex problem for excellence and mobility problem that I assume in one slide. And uh, 
the problem is essentially we have a Boolean expression that is made of Boolean variables that can take two forms for the view. And uh, this uh, expression S is uh, represented here by the end of the part in parentheses are all of these graphs. And uh, the problem S is satisfiable if there is one uh, um, assignment for the variables that makes this kind of signal display. And uh, we call K sat if there are K uh, literals in each case. Okay. So, why 2 sat is polynomial? That is, as the problem grows in size, time, time we need to solve it through polynomial. 3 sat. The problem is that we complete the needs and the same in essence you have to explore two or two to the end possibility to find if the need is or not. And in fact we use one of them. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, to start, uh, um, start it's a very easy natural progenitor of all complex problems. Because all complex problems are proven to be complex, reducing to satisfiability. So, in the okay. On the other side, the Clifford algebra that I explained also very briefly. If uh, we take the linear space uh, uh, R and N, that means with N. Uh, Time like and then space like dimension. Okay, the generalization of how you set physics Boolean Okay, uh, well, for the Minkowski plane, the Clifford algebra corresponds to the algebra of the Boolean matrices and by the tensor properties of Clifford algebra for the Clifford algebra of R and N is the matrix algebra of uh, the, the real matrices of dimension to the end. It means the spinors that are minimal left ideal of the algebra columns of dimension to the end. Okay, uh, just a mention of the, the notation that we use for Clifford algebra given a standard basis of the space vector E with that uh, uh, basis you can buy the bit, a bit you can build the bit basis it is essentially a linear, uh, linear transformation of the vectors that makes the vector null. They are, they are uh, vectors of the real How do we translate And uh, with this basis you can express the linear space as a direct sum of two subspaces that may made entirely of null vectors. Okay? And uh, they will locate it with M, P, and P, maximally, totally, and uh, with the same vectors of the bit basis, you can build the four bases of real space. Okay, then I, I, once you have a, 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 I, I can explain this, but just to give you idea. Now, how you set the Boolean problems in Clifford algebra? Because it's easy to define a, a, a Boolean algebra in the Clifford algebra. Okay, if you call I the set of hidden potents, namely the set of elements that square themselves, okay? you define two binary operations in Clifford algebra. One, sorry, one binary and one binary. The binary is just a Clifford product, and then the binary. And the ordinary operation is 1 minus s, that stands for the logical knot, but you can prove that this is a Boolean algebra. So we have so a Boolean algebra with the method that is not a subalgebra, but still it is. And to make clear in matrix algebra, it is the set of the diagonal matrices of okay. zero so elements. Okay, seems, uh, seems uh, now. We have uh, our Boolean our Boolean problem. We have algebra. We how can we we have defined the Boolean algebra with it? How do we translate our problem? Advantage again. It is simply we assign false to to a variable to a literal the product of two vectors of the bit basis by pi to the complement one minus okay this is for the end and you can replace the logical equation with algebraic equation so I have imported the 
Okay, then at this point in time, once you have a, a, a satisfiability problem or a full expression with these rules, you can transform in, 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 in a general expression in the process. And you can check the normal Boolean property. Okay, now we have translated the uh, problem, the transfer problem into this algebra, and it's easy to prove that since the dissenting is proper, I mean, this was really not cool and algebra, the problem is false, even and only for its corresponding expression, is here and S is equal to Okay. And the proof is simply just expanded into mm -hmm. expression. So, we method, we method uh, the problem. Is this expression probably false or not? We should win an interpretation. Okay, so, this seems, uh, seems uh, there is nothing to gain. And in fact, uh, if you just expand the expression, you will always need to see a type of the order 2 to the n to verify if this expression is the advantage you get is that different algebra is an extremely, an extremely uh, structured uh, setting. I mean, there are a lot of properties that are even to geometry. And so we can look at the sum form essentially at the Boolean problems in the For example, if I know that this has to be zero, okay, to be false, then uh, this is a scalar. And scalars have a particular property, they are fully symmetric. Whatever rotation you make in this space, they remain the same. Okay. Oh, and I just mentioned that a satisfiability test, and then if the expression is true or false, is equivalent to a number. Okay, so a sensibility test is a not a Okay. So, for example, this is the push first approach to what I, I do is I use the problem is for that. And you can say that the problem S is unsatisfied. If and not if there are its corresponding expression of the algebra is set is all the reflection with the generators of the algebra with the expression and this is a signature of the scalar. So if this is a scalar, and the scalar it can be scalar only if it is zero or one. So if track is false, and so we have transformed the uh, satisfiability problem in the symmetry, a problem of symmetry of an expression. In the, of, uh, in the By the way, if you develop this stuff, you find the nice to be my that is essentially the only one algorithm you have to solve this problem. It is the place where it's more refined by the idea. Script and continue to work. Now, to go okay, push so forward in this direction, direction I need to uh, just to present a more formal, uh, more okay, this expression is for S. This is the end of one. several clothes, uh, and the clothes is important in this way as the R of literals. Using the more representation, I get the expression of an end. And so this expression in Clifford algebra becomes 1 minus this, and therefore 1 minus the J. The S expression is the end of this, and so in Clifford algebra it becomes the product of this expression. I don't know the details, I, I will use this expression. Okay, and now I push forward in this direction, and what I, I do is I use the fact that in different algebra there are very many relations between the elements of the different algebra. Okay, for the problem in particular, there are one to one uh, relation between the set of all two to the uh, modules of space that are essentially simple spinners of the algebra in the class of each count y qi one of the two and the two to the end of the end of choice and, and so this all these choice produce a maximum total I transform the three to the end of the top in a set of uh, in a subset of so the rules of spaces and finally an orthogonal. I want to write here no, okay. the orthogonal no, because I have it is the place I where it seems that the script and continuous work now get rid of. 
Oké, ik zou het leven bedienen. Ik weet niet dat ik het Ja, je moet hier een nieuwe trajecten van maken. Dan wordt het een nieuwe trajecten. Dat is je hup. 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 Dat is je if this expression for the cover of the uh, it means there are the relation between the and the set uh, n of n of all infinite uh, subspaces of n. This is okay. Now, final step. Semi go Okay. We can call n of n instead of set of two to the n. Any vector that has the form x t of x is null since its square is the square of v is x squared minus t of x squared, but t of x is belongs to the orthogonal group, and moreover, any null vector of the linear space can be expressed in this form. It follows that there is a natural rejection between the set of null subspaces of this space and the orthogonal group. Okay? And we can define a, a null subspace with this notation because it means all the couple x d of x. Okay. Now the yeah. end. Yeah almost right. Given this rejection, I can ask myself to which t of n correspond the subset made by 2 to the n subspaces, okay? And if you do this work, that is uh, see, easy, you see that this, there is a discrete abelian subgroup of O n that is the group in, in essence of involutions, in which you can change the sign of every direction of the space, okay? This is the group O1 for one direction, and this is the direct product, okay? So in vectorial representation, these are the diagonal matrices with plus or minus on the diagonal. They indicate that every direction is flipped, so are the evolution. Okay, then you can see that the rejection, when restricted to the subgroup, the subgroup of N of 1, has for image the group of null vectors that were associated to simple species. Okay, this is uh, okay. So, but but last step. Now I can write such a little problem in the group O n of one, and uh, such problem with m clauses is unsatisfying if and only if the geometry is induced by its clauses. Uh, with this path, induce the form a cover of the group O n by one again. If the spinner has all the elements of the basis, then the expression we started from is unsatisfied, probably unsatisfied. Okay. okay, but we spend all this time to arrive here, but still ON1 is a discrete group. It has two to the n elements. And so how can I manage to see if my expression is a core? I have to check one by one. And still I am in the uh, I have uh, to check two to the end expression. So the, still this problem is untreatable. As n grows to infinity. Okay. Okay. Now the main result I want to tell you is that if uh, a such problem with n flows is unsatisfactory, if you know if the isometries, some set of n induced by it clauses form a cover of the group or of the parent group. And the, here something is changed because before we had discrete group, now we have a continuous group. Okay? And if I form a cover of the continuous group, my problem is unsatisfied. Okay? And the proof exploits an old result of Cartan on maximally total new space. They said if n2 total in maximally total new space, I can change the basis so that they become two of the maximally total new space of n, two of the discrete set. Okay? This is a very peculiar property. Okay, so the unsatisfactory test is different because ON is a continuous group forming a compact disconnected manifold, and you can move continuously in this group. Okay, and you can, if you find a thing 
a, 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 an element of this group that is not in your S, you have a proof that that problem is solved. Okay. So this seems to establish a, a bridge between continuous and discrete world because I don't need anymore to check separately a, a set of discrete solutions. I have to check if a set of con a set of continuous elements form a cover of this map. Okay. All this. Okay, I don't speak of the application, I just want to bring here this example. Oh, this is the phenomenon in different algebra. This is... Okay. Uh, this is the uh, last slide. Uh, Clifford algebra implies that the dimension of Swinon space is 2 to the n. But ON has a representation also in vectorial space. And so these matrices, ON, can be represented also by n by n matrices, and not by the spinorial representation. So this is one rock to explore. Okay, okay conclusions. So such problems, and in general, Boolean expression, have a remarkable meaning in for algebra, and can take advantage from this algebraic formulation. The set of clauses of uh, such problem in this three set, and I should see the text equivalent to corners of this group. That is a compact disconnection. Now, the question is, is this answer we test relevant to the question? This is, this is an open question. I thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm from Brazil, from Goiás State University. Um, here, the map of my home in the Middle West of Brazil, the state of Goiás. And I will talk about uh, some specific problems in my region connect with the problem of the environment and biocomplexity. Uh, first, uh, I will, will introduce some points in my presentation. First, uh, a brief formalism of the, on the chemical kinect. Uh, second, the application of this brief for, of this formalism in problems in my region, uh, specifically kinetics and drugs degradation process. Uh, afterwards, I will discuss about the application of the machine learning to predict uh, uh, chemical kinetic parameters in degradation process. Uh, and, uh, condensed, uh, uh, and a condensed platform to calculate of this, of this information that is made av available in the internet. And uh, last, I will connect the quality of the water in my region in some specific points uh, with the process of the degradation, pro uh, with the problem of the pesticide degradation problems. Uh, first, uh, with advance of the experimental experimental techniques, it's possible to observe uh, non-conventional behavior in chemical kinetics. And as we can see in this graph, is the Arrhenius plot. The Arrhenius plot is classical a linearized problem, and here we can observe a strong curvature. And to confront this problem. We have proposed, we have inspired in some points, specifically in scaling theory, uh, in the work of the Sulitier, uh, where it's connected uh, scaling parameter in spin glass with activation energy and chemical kinetics. And another con important concept, concept is the Euler limiting used in preliminary step to obtain a probability distribution in seminal Boltzmann work, also used by Maxwell in a similar work. And with this information, we had proposed uh, a specific scaling parameter, is the inverse of the activation energy. We, with this parameter, it's possible to simplify and linearize uh, anomalous problems and connect in some specific connected problems. <laughs> Sorry. With this formalism, a, a brief, of course, a brief formalism, it was possible to condense all this information uh, in a user-friendly platform I've made available in the internet, the transitivity code. 
uh, this platform uh, it's it's a reliable uh, a reliable platform we can be with several publications in the last years uh, uh, application of this formal is uh, can be connected to uh, some important economic problems in our region. Uh, our region, Goiás, in middle in middle west of Brazil, uh, is the livestock and agriculture is an important sector in this region. Uh, for example, my state is the is responsible by around 10% of the production of meat in Brazil. In the same, the same context, we can observe to soil, to soil, and corn production. Another important sector in my region is the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, for example, in my city, is located the second pharmaceutical center in Brazil. It's a function uh, sector in this region. Of course. The discard of the drugs and pesticide in surface waters is a problem in our region. So it's important to propose protocols to mitigate these uh, these micro pollutants, specifically in, in water, in surface water. Uh, and this alternative, an uh, uh, interesting alternative proposed, is oxidation attack of the specific radical like hydroxyl. Uh, single oxygen and other, other molecules. So, uh, the study of the, the connect of this, the, the degradation of the systems is very important. Uh, specifically, the estimation of the reaction rate process in these systems. Another problem very important in pharmaceutical uh, sector in our region is related uh, formation of the mutagenic compound, specific impurity in drugs, uh, in specific drugs. Uh, a specific drug that was uh, very, very concerning in the last years is related to nitrosamine, which is very common in certain in certain groups and drugs derived of the certain groups. It's related to heart attack. So the the main ingredients to to formation of the nitrosating formation of the nitrosamine compounds is three R three nitrosating agents secondary and tertiary amines and acid conditions. Okay, uh, to confront this problem, we have uh, we have uh, proposed a, a collaboration with several. Uh, several partners, experimental and theoretically, and use and use uh, a procedure uh, in chemical kinetics where we can observe the concentration of the specific compounds of the specific uh, drugs or, or pesticide as function of the time, and obtain uh, kinetic parameters in the of course the degradation process of these molecules connected with this formulation. Uh, with these tools, we have um, we have proposed use a uh, theoretical uh, transition state theory in, in their derivatives uh, and other derivatives of this formulation. With this with these tools, it's possible we study first the picloran. The picloran is the most used pesticide in the world, specifically in my region. It's used to control of the pasture in livestock. So we can, uh, with these tools, we can identify mechanisms, kinetics, and ecotoxicity of these molecules in there and its metabolism. The same uh, has been used to two other molecules, hydroxychloroquine (AMTZ). This molecule was indiscriminately used in Brazil against COVID. And we apply the same uh, the same protocol to obtain mechanism, kinetics, and ecotoxicity. So, the process of uh, the the process uh, previously shown is very hard. 
from the experimental and theoretical point of view is very, very, very hard. So propose uh, another, another path ba based on artificial intelligence. It's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting way. Uh, here we use uh, the protocol of the machine learning to catalog several molecules uh, and using um, a specific a specific model like neuro uh, like neuro net network neural network and three decisions. Uh, it's possible to estimate uh, several parameters of the degradations of these molecules very fast and. A key point in this in this protocol is to open the black box of the machine learning. We use the Shapley values uh, based on games theory to connect the the property obtained by the machine learning with the functional groups of the molecules. Uh, and this information uh, was made available in the internet. Here, with this protocol, we can uh, evaluate the echos and atmospheric contaminants as shown in these publications. And with uh, analog, analog, analog protocol, we have uh, confront the problem of the pro uh, formation of dinitrosamine in a specific company in Brazil, because in Brazil it was necessary, it was requested for control agency uh, propose, uh, propose the probability of formation of the nitrosamine in our portfolio of the our pharmaceutical industry uh, company. And we propose uh, and use this, uh, this methodology to propose a, a probability of the formation of the nitrosamine. Here uh, we can see our our platform, this platform, are available, are available in the internet. We can access and insert the smile or scar number of the specific molecules, and you can obtain a preliminary information of the process of the oxidation uh, of the oxidation of this molecule. Uh, finally, uh, we. We have uh, we have uh, collected in several collected sample of the water in several points. This is the map of my, my state, uh, and we have collected several sample uh, of the water in several points of my state, and connected uh, the quality the quality of the water with soil occupation. And of course, we identify several pesticides in these regions, and the main the main pesticide found has been ceromazine and metribuzine, which they are used against uh, as insecticide and herbicide. And uh, we are using uh, the same protocol previously shown to attack this problem from uh, experimental and a theoretical and machine learning point of view. And we have interesting results preliminary his, uh, results about the impact of this pesticide in this specific region and in the quality of the water. So uh, here uh, I would to thank some partner in Brazil, uh, specifically my student, uh, Flavio Sanchez, my uh, PhD student, and of course my friend and uh, collaborator, Professor Vicenzo Aguilante, Thank you for your attention.